Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker who will be talking about the role of the media in our country. It is an important topic because the media should act as a watchdog over the government's actions and the media should set up the agenda for public discussion of issues and facilitate the platform for political expression. Mr. Njebela holds a master's degree in philosophy, development policy and practice, obtained at the University of Cape Town. He also completed a BA media studies degree at the University of Namibia. Since 2007, when he started as a reporter at the Informante newspaper, he has been publishing his articles and his contributions either as a senior journalist at the Windhoek Observer and the New Era, and now as editor of the Namibian Sun. He is a member of the Namibian Training Authority, Post and Telecoms, Industry Skills Committee. He also lectured part-time on economic and political studies at UNAM. His professional development took him to Finland, where he completed the foreign reporting program at the University of Helsinki in 2012. He participated in the program of Good Corporate Governance, NIPAM, in 2016, and in 2017, Mr. Njebela completed the program in Ethical Leadership and Public Accountability at the University of Cape Town. Having been in the media business for his entire career, he is regarded as an expert on the topic media in the political landscape of Namibia. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Mr. Njerpela. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Good <Guten> morning. <laughs> it's still. Uh, still money in time so thank you very much uh, for having me I, I only recently started wearing uh, glasses so I'm they are a bit uh, of a distraction but without them also I, I cannot see properly my text so uh, please uh, forgive me for that but uh, th thank you very much uh, for the kind invite it's a beautiful day here in Swakopmund and uh, for once I come with work and not just to to drive by the dunes and uh, the sea. So thank you very much for that. I think it's a wonderful platform. Uh, Dr. Nakuta gave what I thought was a brilliant and powerful speech. As a matter of fact, Tony and I were just uh, saying during the break that John has set the bar very high with his eloquence and everything. So. Uh, the challenge is also now just to how to keep up with that. John is a teacher. I'm, I'm a writer. I don't stand in front of people. I just write and then people consume what I've written uh, in the paper. But my topic is really democracy and freedom of the press and how those two are intertwined and uh, whether, as a matter of fact, can either of th those two exist without the other? Those are all questions that we seek to expound on in the next few minutes. Uh, this is uh, technology now today. Huh? So I wanted to first give uh, an oversight of the Namibian landscape. Who owns the media? and perhaps even control the media in, in, in Namibia. I did not include 
every media house, but I've taken the major ones in the country. Maybe there are just a few that I've left out. But I think it, I hope it still gives us a sense of uh, who, are the, who are the big guys behind the scenes. So it could surprise a lot of people, actually, that uh, government is numerically the majority owner of uh, the media in the country because if you have the 10 MBC radio stations in those 10, uh, nine vernacular languages and one in English, um, and MBC TV, that is a significant chunk into that space. Uh, so, and then you add New Era, the newspaper, where I've worked also as manage, managing editor until 2019. And then Namibia Press Agency, the government news agency also owned. So, conventionally, if you were to put all those entities together, there's not a single other media house that can boast the number of uh, media outlets as the state. The, there was a newspaper, the Southern Times, that was also co-owned by the Namibian government and the, the government of Zimbabwe. But with the death of um, President uh, uh, Robert Mugabe, um, the, the project sort of started limping until it collapsed eventually. Now, the questions that we ought to be asking ourselves is whether, because of course the good thing is that nobody is prevented at all from setting up their own media entities, but the question could be, if government occupies that entire space, is there any other space left for anybody else to come into that? Because the, it's a small market, it's a small cake from, because you know, we rely, I mean, media sustainability requires that we rely on advertise, advert, adverts and stuff like that in order to sustain the operations. And it's important also to say that uh, why does the state own so much media space? The, the, principle, the principle on paper is that um, is to make sure that key government messages are put out and in languages that people understand. Silozi, Rukwangali, Oshierero, Damaranama, German, Afrikaans, Tswana, um, and all those major Namibian languages. But there's always this perception that there is control also. On the state, on the part of the state, it can be debated. Uh, John Nakuta just spoke earlier on about the managing editor of New Era who was suspended and was on suspension for four months. Uh, he returned to work only recently. I have a separate slide on that because what Jonathan Bierkes did was to question the transparency of the judiciary. These judges, how are they appointed? You just hear that the president, on the recommendation of the Judicial Service Commission, has appointed judge who and who. How does this process unfold? What other names were in, in the fold? It was, to me, a normal, conventional question to ask. To ask, but the newspaper found it otherwise put a big apology on the front page saying, we have suspended the men who asked these questions. We apologize for asking these questions, unheard of. Then, uh, of course, Namibia Media Holdings, where I work, Mr. Albi Bota is uh, essentially the face now. Uh, he and uh, Stimulus uh, stimulus the uh, private equity firm owned by the first lady, the former first lady, were partners. 
Uh, stimulus had just gotten out of NMH recently. Mr. Botta and new partners, I think there'll be new, new announcements in the coming weeks, will announce. Of course, I put his name there because he is already involved. Others, we wait a little bit. The Namibian newspaper, the longest uh, serving uh, English daily in the country, Free Press of Namibia, Gwen Lister has always been around. Uh, definitely one of the trustees uh, and, and, and by implication owner. We have Hit Radio, I hope I am still correct on that ownership, on that ownership there. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, Sibile, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, and, uh, and others. And then Future Media, also a budding media house, really. Uh, we just read recently, a week or two ago, that uh, they have uh, merged with uh, Tribe, Tribe Fire uh, Studios, which owned One Africa TV and 99 FM. So Gary Strubel and uh, Mr. Stefan Hugo are sort of the new faces now there. Radio Wave, Nova, Fresh FM, Omlunga, and now those two, uh, 99 and One Africa, also uh, in, the, in the picture. I think it's important to just have a sense of who are the people behind all these brands. So that when you see news reported in a particular way, it can also help you understand why that could be uh, the case. Continuing, Eagle FM and uh, the village newspaper, the villager newspaper, John Walenga, Martin Shipanga owns Shipi FM, the Swapa Party owns Radio Energy through its uh, Kalahari and Zebra Holdings. Those are two entities belonging to the ruling party and they co-own the radio station, 49%, 51%. The ruling party also has 50% shareholding in, in multi-choice. When you walk into that building in Eros and you pay for your t DSTV subscription, 50% in simplified terms of what you have paid goes to the ruling party's company, Kalahari Holdings. Um, so, multi-choice, of course, is not a media house, but I think because it hosts as a network, as a digital network operator, it hosts different radio stations and TV stations. It's important that we just have that understanding. The why I'm mentioning this also is, for example, that uh, and I'm, I'm not. It has not happened, but just in the future. If a radio station applies for a platform on uh, on, Mar on DSTV, and might be, might be, I'm being a, a, a devil's advocate now here. Um, somehow the, the 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 application is just being rejected. Maybe this radio station has been critical of the ruling party, and the ruling party doesn't feel accommodating a critic on his platforms is, uh, is right, just in case it happens in the future. Have that at the back of your mind. Namib Times, Dr. De Koch, uh, Dr. Koch and uh, Mr. Frankfurt, a legendary regional newspaper for Erongo region. And then we have Mr. Lazarus Jacobs, uh, Desmond Amnella owning Vinduk Observer through uh, Pragon Investment Holdings. Uh, my former editor at Informante, Max Amata, owning now his own paper, Confidente. And Trasco, or Mr. Van Royen, through Trasco, owning uh, Informante, which, is, uh, which has become an online newspaper. We were part of the, uh, it's where I started my, my career, as a matter of fact. And uh, yeah, so, that is the general picture of the landscape. I thought before we go into democracy and free press that we needed to have that understanding. Now, 
democracy, I don't want to get into the academic definitions. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, it was uh, Harold who has already ventured into those definitions. As a matter of fact, the second definition there is exactly word by word what Harold has uh, read out to us. But I thought on the first topic there, on the first definition, because that is a perception of many people, especially in our country, that we are the, the, the election results show that we were the, the majority and therefore it's the rule of the majority. That's where we are asking the question of the tyranny of the majority. Do we say because others came out in the minority after elections, their rights do not matter as much as uh, those of the majority, for example? There's been a, a huge debate last year, same-sex marriages and many other things. And uh, there's been those phrases to say that some people in the country who are in the minority in some way or another they are subjected to the will of the majority and it impacts them in a, in, a, in a major way. So there ought to be consideration of even those that lost elections if there's such a thing. And I think it's important that our leaders understand that it's more than just a numbers game, minority, majority. There has to be a system of governance in which the state power is vested in the people. Uh, John was talking about consultation, participation, and all those things. If you say, oh, I've been elected as a leader, and therefore now I just make decisions without fetching your mandate from the people, then I think we have a problem. Press freedom. The simple definition really is the right of the media to report news without being controlled by government. And in the Namibian context, press freedom is not just an abstract inferred from other, from the constitution. It's actually in black and white under Article 21 of our constitution that all persons shall have the right to freedom of speech and, and expression, including in black and white, freedom of the press and other media. So I have just added the social media because of course, in 1990, when we were adopting this constitution, social media did not exist. So maybe the question is, does that also include the, the, the freedom of social media? Um, and perhaps what is important, and John, can, John is more qualified than me on this, Article 21 is part of the fundamental rights and freedoms under our constitution. Is, is, is that part of the constitution that you don't touch, that you, don't, you do not um, uh, amend, unless there's a, a referendum, I think. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not only John, but Tony herself also uh, can, can, can speak to that. So when we demand press freedom in our country, we are not just asking for favors. We are asking the leaders of our country to uphold what they have sworn in front of us with a Bible in their hand sometimes to say that they will uphold the constitution of Namibia. Once you say that, you are telling us that you, you are also going to uphold press freedom. So Reporters Without Borders is a major international organization based in France, concludes that freedom of the press is firmly anchored in Namibia uh, and uh, there has been indexes that come out, come out every year. Uh, next month in April, there ought to be another ranking coming out so that we see whether Namibia is still number one. We are currently number one, for the record. Um, we've, we slipped to number two the previous year, bounced back to number one. But issues like uh, the suspension of uh, Jonathan Baker's at New Era, I think, unless the colleagues did not pick that up, which is highly unlikely, are likely to affect the way our ranking will come out this time around. And I think it, it will be justified because we do not just want to be on top of the charts for the sake of it. It must be because of substance. 
Now, the press regulatory environment in Namibia, very, very important topic um, because regulators, especially in other states, is where the opportunity to suppress freedom of the media exists in, in abundance. So, of course, for the broadcasters, CREN is in charge of that, issuing of licenses, revoking licenses, it hasn't happened, it has not really happened. Uh, not for political reasons anyways, maybe you don't pay for a license fee or anything like that. But uh, CREN is responsible for regulating the broadcasters. Print and electronic, and that is where John Nakuta comes in, we are really subjected to the Code of Ethics, which uh, John's office, the Media Ombudsman's office, enforces. So if we are truthful, if we are accurate and balanced and independent in our reporting, then we can stay away from John. John will never see our faces. It is in moments when we do not tick off all those boxes that we find ourselves in front of John and his committee asking us to explain ourselves, how did you defame this person? You did not check your facts. You did not give the person the right of reply. And therefore, by implication, you did not adhere to the code of ethics. And uh, these are the consequences. Now, the importance of the media ombudsman's office is that it helps particularly ordinary people who cannot afford lawyers, to go to court and wait for three years, four years, paying hefty fees. Sometimes people just want a simple recourse to say, you got your facts wrong and I need you to rectify that. I need you to apologize to me. My, 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 my reputation is, is tarnished. So once you do that, uh, the media ombudsman, the, the, the procedures that you follow to lay a complaint, a conciliation meeting is called, the parties are called to the, ta to the table. If the media is brave enough to say, look, uh, yes, we got our facts wrong, we are ready to apologize, the matter is cleared. Not a single, not a single cent is spent. Except, of course, uh, if there's no agreement and then it can be escalated through further processes, might be up to the court eventually. But also in terms of regulation, the media is like, like everybody else, subject to the Namibian constitution. With freedom comes limitations also. So we can't say, oh, it's press freedom and therefore we are just free to, you know. I just gave a ex small example there that, for example, rape victims may not be uh, uh, identified. Uh, but that is more, again, to do with the code of ethics and, uh, and everything. But it's also the protection of uh, those people in the constitution. Where we have a bit of, pro of, a pro of a problem is the state media, where despite what the law says, so it's free press, is what, there is actually a strong element of control. I've worked in that space, I know what I'm talking about. So what happened to Jonathan Baker's of uh, New Era last year is exactly part of that problem. How dare you question the judiciary? How dare you question the appointment made by the president? It came through the Judicial Service Commission and therefore your job is only to report. That cannot be right. Some years ago, MBC used to have a program, a news review program called The Week That Was. I was a regular commentator on that show. We take the newspapers of the week, the headlines, and then you, a group of journalists on that, plat on that show will go into the details, what happened? Why is the minister on the front page? Why is the CEO uh, suspended? All these things. And there was this perpetual complaint by government officials. You are embarrassing the state. You have to kill this program. Today, that program is gone because it's where independent journalists from the private sector, from public uh, media, sat and say, yes, this is what transpired. The minister stole, or whoever, the president's son got a tender irregularly, 
and you know ACC is not doing anything, it was seen as embarrassing. That is state control at work. The current state of press freedom, nevertheless, is that of course Namibia is number one in Africa. We are waiting for the 3rd of May now uh, to see whether we retain that position or the, the Jonathan situation has knocked us, knocked us off the perch. Now, there's this phrase that our leaders like talking about. You know, it's free countries, free press. Not once in 34 years of independence have we seen a Namibian journalist arrested. You know, it's, 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 the, it's the narrative that state actors like running with. And it's true, but is it enough? If people are not arrested, does that tick all other boxes? It does it. Because you may not have arrested Jonathan Bierkes, but you suspended him for four, for four months. So that is still, I mean, if he was, if he was suspended for administrative issues at work, you know, you are not feeling in leave, you are forever absent from work, you are, you know, you come to work without uh, whatever. That's a different conversation. He was suspended for questioning the transparency in the judiciary. There's no question about the violation of press freedom in that regard. The verbal and legal threats are rife in, in, in our industry. I suppose you can't live without those. If you go ahead with that story, I will sue you. You work for a small radio station, a small newspaper, you're afraid. The company is not willing to spend money on lawyers to say, ah, we leave the story. It happens. These are realities on the ground. Of course, the president, uh, the late president in, in December 2022 uh, signed into law the Access to Information Act, but there are other tools that need to be in place, such as the creation of the Office of the Information Commissioner, which need to be in place for us now to start implementing that correctly. But as matters stand today, there's no law compelling public officials to reveal and avail certain information, even information that is really crucial in empowering communities if it was put in the public domain. This one is not a current, the last one is not a current affair, but I thought we must just really remember that there was a time when for 10 years the Namibian newspaper had been banned from government, from receiving government advertising because it was seen as, anti, as an anti-government newspaper at the time. So, press freedom and democracy, where, how do they correlate? Why do they matter? Why do they rely on each other? So, press uncovers truth for citizens. We go at length as journalists to say what the hell is going on in this particular thing? Why, why, why are things like this? Fish rod. That truth was uncovered or brought into the public domain by the media. Of course, people in government might have known about it and they sat on that information. Fish rod did not come to the fore because a minister stood up and came to the podium and said, oh, listen, everybody, we have a scandal in the country. So much money has been stolen. No, the opposite actually happened. It was the media that picked, picked up this and it was put in the, in the domain. Press, free press, holds power accountable without fear of retribution because if you are guaranteed freedom to report and pursue the truth in a democratic space, then you cannot be afraid of uh, being reprimanded the next day, losing your job, going to jail, or even getting shot, at least in Namibia. But it happens elsewhere a lot. 
especially in, on the African continent, where journalists are languishing in jail because they attempted to ask questions and say, but minister, this is what you promised, this is what, this is what your manifesto says, and you did not deliver on that. The last point on that is uh, that the free press helps citizens make informed democratic decisions, especially in the year like this. Because the 99.9% .9 of the people who are going to vote in November have never met any of these candidates in, in person. The little that they know about, is not, not the little, everything that they know about these candidates is through the media. They see them on television, they see them being quoted in newspapers, they hear them on the radio. That is why the media exists, to say we convey these messages so that people can make their decisions. Uh, John spoke earlier about uh, former minister Jerry Akanjo. I was in trouble for the most part of last year because Jerry Akanjo came up with, uh, of course, the anti-gay laws. It is, uh, I mean, bills. It is his right as a, as a citizen to want society to function in a particular way as he sees it from his own perspective. That's fine. But what troubled me a lot in his bills is a clause that sought to fine or jail anyone that is seen to have promoted the idea of homosexuality or same-sex marriages and stuff like that. You can have your own view on these things, no problem. But to say that whoever is seen to say, for example, you know, legalize this, can go to jail. That's a cardinal, sentimental, personal liberty to express yourself and it's in our constitution. So that was very, very disturbing. But people were saying, how do you give people like Jerry Kanjo a platform? Shame on you, Namibian son. Shame on you, Toivo. Because his views are toxic and harmful, he shouldn't speak. I'm saying no. Namibian people deserve to see their leaders in their totality so that when they make up their decision during voting processes, they know exactly who to vote for. If there's anyone who aligns with Jerry Akanjo's stance on this matter, let them have that informed position and vote for him. Those who think that uh, his views are a non-starter, give them that information so that they make an informed decision at the ballot, assuming, of course, that Jerry Akanjo was, was contesting. The last slide really is exactly what uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher said. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That should be the principle, to say that we don't have to agree with, uh, with each other. Uh, but we have at all material times to defend that that right of, of others to, as, as guaranteed in the Constitution. John spoke about the lack of justice in one space affecting justice in other spaces. It is the same principle here. And I can tell you, John and I only met in this meeting today, so we did not even compare notes and say, oh, let me do something similar. The thinking is just similar in that regard. So that was my small input to the conference. Thank you very much. So uh, the, the good doctor asked me to um, stay put <laughs> in case there are any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Toivo. I just want to remind us that we are still on Zoom and YouTube. And um, I think, first of all, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. And I think he deserves another round of applause. And then I'm here to invite questions. And I already see the first one.
Thank you very much, Mr. Toivo, for your great presentation. Um, my question would be, I mean, we have been elaborating a lot about the freedom of press and uh, where are the, the, um, the loopholes and also uh, those that do not speak to, to uh, freedom of, spe uh, of speech and press and there are some examples uh, truly uh, given by you here and we all experience it in the, in the past and, uh, and it's good to pay attention to that. Uh, but my question would be also what are or what is the obligation of the press when it comes to fake news, disinformation, because the one thing is of course to have a free environment which is important for democracy yeah. um, uh, and also that uh, of course people can make up their opinion, make up their mind, especially looking at, at elections, how, how the media is informing them about, about the leaders, about the candidates and so forth, but also in terms of, of fake news and disinformation, how do you have anything in, in place uh, because these things happen not only in Namibia, elsewhere, especially in the, in the social media, and because this might also have a negative impact. Because people, especially young people, when I talk to them, they do not res uh, do research anymore. Yeah, so they just read the headline and then they share, and then the story goes his way. So uh, and have his own dynamic and yeah. pictures also tell stories. So uh, that would be also my my part uh, to contribute to ask you. Uh, what is the concern of the media when it comes to disinformation? Thank you. Um. Time to answer first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see Mr. Flaxmill, uh, Flaxman Samuel, my good friend is uh, okay. So it's, it's, it's a good question, uh, especially on obligations to say what is our what is our obligation as a media in that regard so the, part of the answer is really why we have the office of uh, the media ombudsman especially where fake news is seen to have been deliberately perpetuated by the so-called legacy media social media is a is a, is a diff difficult space to control, especially because uh, sometimes, um, you know, it's individual citizens who are coming up with these things. Sometimes they use our, our logos and create fake headlines and then fake information, put it out there and you get people saying, you Namibian son, where did you get this from? And then you, re you realize that someone created a fake banner with your, with your, with your logos to spread this uh, fake information. But I think uh, many media houses now, uh, especially where I work, we have internal control measures. They are not watertight all the time. Sometimes they uh, they fail us a little bit, but um, there's a vigorous process that we go through before anything is put out. So there's there's fake news, but there's also news that is not essentially fake but it contains a lot of inaccuracies and it, it bites into your credibility as a, as, a, as a publication. So there is that in place. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. Uh, because the problem also with uh, the evolution of the media space is that there are always new things in which uh, fake news slip through our fingers. You thought you had your, water, you had your system watertight and then something else comes up a new innovation and then you cannot detect that. So we are constantly on the lookout to see how we can uh, arrest that. But it's a, it's a serious concern. Thank you. Over to Fluxman. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, let me just start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is uh, Fluxman Samuel. I'm a former member of parliament uh, about 20 years ago under Nuyoma era and I'm a scholar of international relations and strategic studies. I, I think I'd like to start by thanking uh, Toivo for a very enlightening presentation in terms of the media space in a democracy. Uh, I have uh, actually just a few observations to make, not really questions. First, I think uh, in a modern world where we live now, 
because media is not just a conveyor of information or a messenger, but in a development state such as Namibia, the media ought to realize that uh, they are a catalyst for nation building, which is as relevant as it was in 1990. Some of these things, the conversation that had been discussed earlier about the joint declaration, uh, people are divided, they can't come to a common position how to tackle an issues of national interest. I believe the media can play a role to assist in bringing people together. So in terms of nation building and national interest positions, I think the media can play a role. Mind you, I mean, just last week uh, in East Africa, Rwanda commemorated 30 years of the genocide. The media was at the center of that uh, genocide the scandal uh, about 30 years ago. So in Namibia, a country like Namibia, we cannot afford that we shift away from nation building. Then uh, I agree with you fully that the media has a role to hold the leaderships to account, to expose the rot without fear and favor. Uh, I think that's important, but I, I think the late president, Genkop, has been making public announcement, of course, that as long as he's around, um, uh, free press or rights of media will continue to be upheld. I, I would like to think that uh, the government of the day and the leaderships that are there are still committed to those values uh, to ensure that the media uh, play its role in a democracy, in a development state. Finally, just like, and I want to come to a development state, uh, because uh, uh, we had earlier on talked about the gap between the haves and the have not that is a threat to stability and peace. So I think uh, the media has also an important role, of course, to improve the depth of reporting, depth of writing. Um, I think there is much to be done. I think that's the intervention that I really wanted to do, but uh, really, once again, uh, your presentation is really enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This was an intervention, um, not so much a question. Anything you would like to comment on it? No, I think just briefly, the last point by Flaxman uh, about depth. It's a real concern in the industry. Um, it's a structural issue because um, we groom journalists. I've been in this industry for 18 years now, uh, and I'm one of, uh, probably one of the longest serving now in the industry. But others that we started together with, because with time you learn, you accumulate um, uh, experience and you improve how you work. But those that we started together with uh, have left the industry long ago. They've gone into better paying jobs, uh, uh, corporate communications and stuff like that. And um, we constantly have to bring in new people. And just as they start to capture the essence of journalism, then they leave again. So it's a perpetual thing, but uh, your observation is 100% spot on. Thank you. I've seen two more hands there in the back. Oh, three actually. Good morning. I'm Seth Ngovasep. I, I'm a teacher. I teach at uh, UNAM. Um, my questions are two. The first one is, do we hide behind the notion that uh, the press um, no journalist is being arrested, we are number one, uh, and therefore that's good enough. Where are we globally and why do we never talk about our global positioning in terms of press freedom? Uh, that's first. Uh, the second one is, do the media houses have to have internal censorship to avoid the raft of the state? Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, sir. So, 
I, I'm sorry that I, I, I omitted to include the, uh, I, I think we get excited about being number one in Africa and then we just forget <laughs> that, <in, laughs> that there's also a place called the world. I think, uh, I think we are number 22nd in the world. 22nd, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so that's where we are globally and it's, 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 a, it's a magnificent position to occupy in a world that has so many leading democracies in the Scandinavia, the, the model democracies like the US and the UK. Uh, and we are above usually a lot of those model countries. So I think it's really, really good. On uh, censorship, uh, I don't personally encourage it. Um, I think truth must be told. Uh, I have, for 18 years, gone through everything that a journalist can go through um, because we are committed. Because I, I say to my team, if we are sure of our facts, when we go home at night and put your head on that pillow, you know you have nothing to fear tomorrow because you can defend your truth at any platform. So I do not tell people ever to, to hold back facts as long as uh, it is verified. I think we are good to go. Thank you. I think I've seen the hand of Charles. Charles again. Um, my comment is on the radios. As I said, I'm from Falkas, a very remote area in Klaras region. And the radio is one of the main information platforms that are available to the residents of Falkas and uh, otherwise other remote areas. Um, we get information through Tamara Nama Radio, uh, K Sam is currently renamed. And that is the only radio that probably comes through in our area. You get all sorts of news. The guys who are looking after the animals will tell you that the labor, uh, what is this, minimum wage has changed. All critical issues against the government as well as for the government are shared through the radios. Uh, you mentioned controls. Does that tie in with censorship or what does control mean from your perspective, state control? Because as, I, as far as I know, you know, the information that is um, disseminated through the radio stations, it's quite wide and open and transparent. Um, probably, I'm a bit naive, I don't know, but, but uh, as far as I know the information that is shared, it's, it's critical, critical demonstrations, insults against presidents or whatsoever, it's being disseminated through the radios. Uh, controls, does it tie in with censorship? That's why I want to pause. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, so, it's, it's a it's soft control. Um, it's not too radical, it's not uh, too obvious. Like I said, I've worked in that space. Uh, as a matter of fact, my first job as a trainee was at uh, NBC as a, as a radio reporter. And um, there are things that have been pulled out of uh, those years that were pulled out of the news programs because uh, they would uh, offend some people in government. It, it happens. The radio, I can tell you, I, I agree 100% with you that uh, radio is the most powerful tool for rural and, and remote communities. That is 100% true. And John just spoke earlier about the People's Parliament on NBC TV is really a wide and open platform for people to even crit critique and criticize government. That is true. But there are classic examples of people, there was a, some years ago, not too long ago, the there was an opposition member who was interviewed on NBC's one-on-one -on -one program, that one-on-one -on -one program. And NBC made a teaser in advance. The program is airing two days in advance. You do a small teaser just to create hype around the broadcast. 
it was pulled. We can't have a person speaking like that appearing on national television, it was pulled. I know that there are people at MBC who work very, very hard, who are truly professionals, but they are also just under pressure from more powerful people and, and, and these things happen. So that is sort of the, the con it doesn't happen uh, all the time, but it does happen. And that is, uh, it shouldn't be happening. The country is for all of us. You, there's another hand, yes. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Dietrich Remmert from the Institute of Public Policy Research. Um, you, I, I came a bit late, so apologies if you already spoke to about, about it, but I wanted to make more comment and then a uh, follow-up question. Um, I think one of the huge issues, and you did allude to a bit to it already, is sort of the financial sustainability of, of traditional news, ma news media. I mean, this is an international huge issue, but it seems that Namibians don't really realize how critical it is. Um, and perhaps you can speak to that as an editor. Uh, you know, when, when we did, over the last couple of years, we did a couple of media studies focusing particularly on sustainability issues. Um, editors were all saying basically, you know, newspapers is getting eaten by social media. You know, they're losing, they're losing ad revenue like, like nobody's business. Um, and the digital space is so competitive and so, so hard to make money out of compared to, you know, your traditional news, newspaper. Um, it, it makes it very tough. And, you know, you, you mentioned it, I think, the, the Observer. The Observer has gone online. Um, the Namibian Economist is gone years ago. They're, they're purely online as well. Um, other publications are also struggling. You see sort of the... The Namibian, you know, everybody is shrinking, the pages are getting smaller and smaller, um, and digital channels, I think one of the good things we've seen through Corona is that media is trying to now focus more on the digital stuff because they're seeing that will have to be the future. Um, but still, it's, it's very tough, be tough because you're competing internationally. Um, a lot of young people in the West, they get their news from TikTok. I'll, I'll be short. Um, so maybe you can just speak to some of those challenges and, and what uh, maybe especially NMH is currently doing around that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the, it, it's true. Uh, media sustainability is a huge topic now, a uh, relevant topic. The, there is, um, and and it's the, danger, it's a, the danger with that is that it bites, it, it threatens the independence, first, of, first and foremost, the independence of the media. And uh, so what we have is a situation where media houses, the, the, the legacy traditional media houses face extinction if nothing happens very fast. First is the evolution that needs to take place, the digital evolution so that you monetize your digital uh, platforms, and s sustainably so. Uh, NMH, and I hope it's not a, a, a trade secret, but uh, I think we have done incredibly well in that regard because the, our revenues on Namibian Sun, for argument's sake, our readership now, 80%, 80% of our readership is online. Only 20% really of our readership is derived from, uh, from print. And when you tell people, the other day I was speaking to the presidential, uh, presidential press secretary, uh, that was when President Hage Ginkov was still alive, and there was a statement from State House, we put it online quickly, and uh, Alfredo Hengari, the, the, sp the spokesperson said, look, um, the president is kindly asking if you guys can also put it in the, in the paper. Then I, I was explaining these numbers now, 80%, 20%. And he was saying, oh, you don't know, old people. Old people, if it doesn't appear in print, they don't feel like it, uh, it had gone out. <laughs> so, so with that understanding also, it's, it's, it's very, very important. So the, the, the sustainability, the commercial sustainability has become challenging. And the danger with that is that it can also affect ethics because once you realize that the, 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 the financials are, 
uh, in a bad shape and you can almost compromise yourself for profits. Uh, that's why it is very, very critical that the media find ways in which it can, they can sustain themselves so that they can retain that sense of independence. M MC, I've seen two hands up. Uh, thank you very much so far for your overview. Uh, very important was the ownership of the media houses. And I saw that uh, they are mostly Namibian owned. So what's about the foreign or external influences, for example, CNN or Russia Today or something like that, these big international media houses, do they have stakes here in the existing media houses or what's the influences? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think so far, really, and, and, and that is maybe why our industry is struggling a bit financially. We don't have foreign, huge foreign shareholders or equities that could have uh, boosted our, our income. I know for argument's sake that uh, some years ago, Namibia Media Holdings, which owns Namibian Sun, Republican, and Argument is Zeitung, that uh, we used to be co-owned by News24 of South Africa. And uh, because Namibia is such a small market, it meant really nothing for News24 commercially. Uh, they felt like, like they were wasting their time here. There isn't really money coming out of Namibia. Uh, they sold their stake and, and got out. So if you are coming, so it's a very difficult space to invest in because it's not very lucrative in Namibia. Uh, it can sustain us locally but internationally it would mean very very little maybe that is why there's no appetite to invest here but it turns out actually very well because uh, at least the, the agenda is locally driven uh, and and it's good it's good that way thank you i'm task not as the german ambassador i wish i could say like dr nakuta i'm not here in my official capacity but as an ambassador, you are always in an official capacity. Mm -hmm. I have a question um, relating to what you just said, the 80% of your readers who are reading what you write online. Um, my question is, what are people interested in? What are the products that they are interested in? Is it politics? Is it economics? Is it culture? Is it sports? Is it what about Prince Harry and whatever? Yeah. I'm asking that question because um, when I served in Indonesia some time ago, we, we did an analysis of how long people actually stayed on our home pages. That was very embarrassing. It was only two seconds because a lot of people ended up there and they didn't even want to be on our home page. And the other thing was, um, the, the, the highest number of likes that we received was when we posted photos of the, our cat. We had a cat on the embassy <laughs> compound and the cat had kittens, it had litter. So that, that was the biggest thing. Or a cat photo always sells. So my question is, what are your cat photos? Yeah? What, what is it that your readers are, what do they really care about? And I want to add one thing. When I arrived here in July, um, somebody said to me, people are not, Namibians are not interested in politics. Namibians are interested in economics, in employment, in jobs, in what about the future? So I'm eager to hear your answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, His Excellency. Yeah, it's very, very, interesting that you just mentioned the, the cat scenario there because <laughs> it is indeed also what you find attracting a lot of mileage here that if you have um, politics you know you unless it was a photo that John posted here from mix settle, settlement then people will say, oh yes, it's good, you know, people are being held accountable and there are memes being made out of these photos and whatnot. But serious politics, state of the nation address, budget speech, of course, perhaps things like budget speech are a bit uh, technical 
uh, people do not understand inflation and all those things, so it becomes a bit boring to them. But socio-economic, the simplified socio-economic issues, uh, the suffering of people, oh, this company has employed uh, 500 people, or the company has given its employees uh, some sort of equities through a, a, trust, a trust, they find those things very interesting. Um, sport, I think, really this incredible uh, interest in that. But pictorially, the, we insist, uh, especially at my workplace, that we must really invest in cameras and, and be creative with those cameras and, 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 and take simple photos of a child crossing a river on a, Saturday, on a Wednesday morning going to school in the rain or whatever. They find those kind of things very, very interesting. So, but I think part of the problem why people are not interested in your supposed, supposedly high level topics, economics and, and business perhaps is also the level of literacy, not in, the, in terms of reading and writing, but in terms of really comprehending what these things mean. $100 billion worth of budget released this year, what, what does it mean? So if people understood all these things, I think, then uh, it can improve conversations. Thank you, Aima. Um, is it on? Atari, thank you very much for a very enlightening speech you have given so far and also the very interesting answers to these important questions. I have two questions. The first one is I've just looked in my app store. There's not a single app for NMH, the Republican, the Sun, or the Allgemeine Zeitung. If you are truly digitalizing, this, I think, should be a, a big priority. And my second question is, we've been told last night, we who had the privilege of dining with our uh, esteemed speakers today, that there was, during this week, a talk to a group of about 60 third-year law students by a German uh, expert. And in the end, he asked how many of them had heard about the joint declaration. And only five raised their hands, which shows to me that the media houses, and in particular uh, NMH, with its various publications, has a huge responsibility to draw the attention to this smartphone generation. I mean, uh, we were just recently told uh, by the first results of the census that 1.6 million inhabitants of our country are 35 years and younger. That is the smartphone generation. And Dr. Nakuda told us that the reason why they are so disinterested is they are constantly on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and all these other things. So I think there is a huge responsibility. Would you share this with me? Thank, thank you, Raima, <coughs> for that. So, <laughs> on the on the app, <laughs> I uh, I know we used to have one. I don't know what transpired really, um, because it's, with NMH, there's always there's constantly new innovations, and and, and when we look at uh, the hits, they are not encouraging. I think we just move on to other things and. Probably part of the problem is exactly what you mentioned, that instead of people accessing these apps to really consume news that you thought matters, they are more interested in uh, dancing on, on, on TikTok, especially the, <laughs> the, the young people. And the older people who are interested in news, they are not into those things. They want their hard copy uh, as they, 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 they are used to. Maybe that is part of the problem. On uh, the joint de declaration, I think there's also something called uh, reader's fatigue. When a, when a subject drags on and on, even us who are in the media and who operate at the highest level as editors, there are just moments where you feel, ah, it's this subject again. And it's repetitive. There isn't really any progress. It's just people again demanding this or people, there, there's no real updates to say, in this regard, this is the latest inroads that we've made and therefore, you know, the next stage is this and that. So I suspect that uh, uh, subjects like genocide, which is very, very crucial, 
by any standard. But when it becomes repetitive, I think people just lose interest a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. So, voter apathy is. Um, if you if you listen, Raima, to to people, your average person. Who did I speak to this week? I spoke to someone young, a young lady this week. I don't know how that topic popped up, but she had no idea what not voting means. They were saying, yeah, I know, how do you vote and just give other people jobs? They go to parliament, they make their money, they forget about us, because that is the, the understanding. I'm saying, how about voting in order to keep these ones out? She didn't understand that concept. So young people in particular, I think, have a long way to go in understanding and comprehending what elections mean. That's why I, I suspect that really older people, not necessarily the pensioners, but older people, I think, make up a huge majority of these voters. Some years ago, there was this joke, in the last election, there was this joke on social media about young people saying, yeah, guys, we must steal our grandmother's uh, voter cards on election day so that they don't go and, uh, because they keep voting, <laughs> old people that are failing us. So you could see that they understand that it's mostly that generation that votes, uh, and uh, I find that interesting. But the media, of course, has a, a right, a responsibility to teach and educate. Times have changed. Sure, sure. I, I remember okay, that. Okay, I think we should allow another question now because somebody's already waiting for a long time. MC, I just would like to make an addition from my side about uh, foreign media. You can receive Russian TV here, and I've seen Chinese newspaper in English. The question was here. Thank you. There have been cases of people who have written newspaper articles that the media has published, and as a result, they got censored, they couldn't get jobs, they are prominent people who cannot get employment because when there's an interview, apparently a phone call comes from there, and the companies are afraid to employ those people as a result. Some of these people get in lot of trouble, and as docile as we are, as Namibian, we sometimes keep quiet because we don't want to be treated like that. What does the media house do uh, to highlight those kinds of things? I'm sure you guys know about some of those people who have been sent that they cannot get a job and stuff. Even when there are opportunities for interviews, they get canceled just a, a few minutes before because a phone call has gone out. What does the media do and how can media address? Because essentially it instills fears in companies as well as Namibians and lots of us Namibians also keep quiet because we don't want to be treated. How does media help bring those to the fore and what can media do to highlight those kinds of things? Thank you. Yeah. So, so on, on um, I, 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 I do two TV shows uh, online and they also broadcast on our, our in-house TV station. Um, and I struggle a lot with getting quality guests on these platforms. People who would ordinarily speak to you in confidence and say, no, but we need to have this conversation. How can uh, this particular issue be going on and on like this? Calling people in studio. And you look at this person and you think, there's no better person actually to talk about this than this person. Do you want to come to the platform? No, I can't. Why? Because victimization and all these things. So we have a serious problem of speaking truth to power. Because for me, really, maybe I'm naive, but my thinking is that if things are true, if I can defend my views, there shouldn't be a problem. But we have adopted a culture where you will be victimized, they will seek some people, they will seek to starve your children, they will close the taps, so that they teach you a lesson. How dare he speaks about us like that? But it's true, 
and I'm speaking within the framework of, uh, of my rights as a, as a citizen, but somehow it happens that way. That's why if you read newspaper articles, there's so much anonymous sources. According to sources, this, ha this happened. Accord according to, and some of these people are actually people authorized to speak on this subject. But even with that mandate, they are scared to go on record because things could just turn out badly. And that's why I think platforms like this, uh, the media, civil, civil society, we have to perpetually advocate for speaking truth to power and openly so that we get into the habit as a country of con having a conversation, even uncomfortable conversations. Thank you very much. Toiva, you might uh, now accuse me for hijacking your platform, but that is really not the point. Uh, the op what is it, the reason why I'm doing this? But actually, I'm changing it. I'm throwing it back to us. The Office of the Media Ombudsman is embarking upon a very ambitious project, and it is an election monitoring project, whereby we are going to do a content analysis on how the media, as part of the obligation imposed by the code, is reporting on all candidates, all political parties, and specifically female candidates, hmm. um, in a manner that is consistent with the, with the code, objectively, neutrally, without trying to frame and set the agenda. Very ambitious project. It's not being done previously. It's the first time, the first of its kind in Namibia. So why do I mention this? I'm actually here now, using this opportunity, hijacking it, to make a passionate plea for those of us as Namibians that want to support this in one way or the other. We must now reach out to foreign um, institutions um, and organizations for financial, because this is a very financial, financially intensive uh, project that we want to launch covering both the pre-election, the election phase, as well as the post-election phase to see how we are living up as a media to the code. But we don't have funds. So I'm asking whether or not we as Namibians, organizations that believe in democracy, because this is very much part of democracy and defending our democracy, which we feel is under siege, even by ourselves as the media. So this is the passionate plea for us to contribute to this project, especially financially, in one way or the other. Thank you so much. Yes, um, just a quick one. Um, I think uh, earlier on uh, there was a comment about apathy, uh, voter apathy and the role of the media. I, I just want to give some perspective as a scholar. I think uh, in 1989, I think a reference was also made in the elections, which I participated fully as a student, and I'm really delighted to have Bishop Kameta here in our midst who play a very, very enormous uh, role at that time to mobilize uh, Namibian people. Uh, I think there was uh, um, a, an a euphoria uh, at 1989. Uh, remember that, um, of course, the liberation struggle was a very, very long one, and people were looking forward uh, what it looked like in a post-independent era. I think people were participating in that. I think after independence, I think with the Namibia Statistics Agency's um, um, population census, about 70% youth, uh, w the position where I sit, I'm not convinced that uh, we will see still a great number of young people participating uh, where I sit. 
the reason is um, uh, I think the greater part of the youth in Namibia are still trapped in social media, particularly just on entertainment. I think they are more detached, if you like, uh, from politics. Uh, they, uh, the greater part of the Namibian youth today don't realize that uh, uh, politics is uh, why things happen the way they do. Uh, and uh, they don't realize they have that power to direct the narratives. Uh, and Namibians in general, especially the young people, you know, they can get excited quickly. And also quickly, that excitement can also die. I am asking myself now, uh, what is it that really is there to excite, especially the, the young people? And I think what is going to happen, given the influence of South Africa uh, in our country, uh, the elections n end of next month, uh, that outcome, uh, I think, will be analyzed here in Namibia. And I think it may have a, a degree of influence how people will turn up to vote, and particularly also whether young people will also register and, and eventually vote, whether young people are prepared to stand in the queue uh, 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 under a, a scorching sun uh, for a few hours and so on, or whether they will prefer electronic uh, voting uh, while they are there in their bedrooms. So I think these are the, the really issues and so on. So I'm not convinced that uh, these 70% of youth uh, will participate and so on. But uh, of course they will talk a lot, but uh, because the youth organization, as I end, youth organization before independence, they were very robust, very strong, very energetic. The National Youth Council almost has collapsed leadership. Uh, youth organization politically, uh, they are inactive or half dead. Um, uh, the youth are not organized uh, and all that. So these are the reality, I think the signs that led me to think that I think I'm still suspicious that I think we, we cannot just uh, think that the youth, so they will make a difference. Put your, your, your trust still to your traditional voters. I think that's what I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, again, a statement and not a question. Um, we are moving into our lunch break, but I think there is so much interest that, because it's a long lunch break, I think I can allow to the discussion to continue. And we have uh, a hand up here. Sorry. Mine is also more a comment and also some compliments and some fact-finding. Um, I think there's a, a need to clarify press freedom. Very often, fake news, misinformation is spread under the name of press freedom. And we had an experience as German-speaking community in Namibia last year, hands-on with that one. There was a documentary on German TV, uh, one of the state-owned German TV companies, um, ARD and NDR, that had a production on the uh, German guilt as part of the colonial era. But it, the facts that were mentioned were so wrong that we, as a forum, and fortunately we've got an organized platform in Namibia, had to clarify those facts and ask for the removal of the documentary. To cut a long story short, in the end, the documentary was removed from all German TV channels, but uh, the irony and the pity of it is that the important topic of German colonialism and the sins that were committed did not get the exposure that it deserved. So I'm saying there's a special responsibility when it comes to press freedom. Looking at quickly at the Namibian models uh, in our media, I'm well informed, um, and, and, and Toivo mentioned it, and thanks once again for your fantastic presentation. Um, there's always the question of ownership structure and the profit maximization objectives which play a big role in the media. I know uh, that uh, former President Trump is the owner of the Washington Post, I think. We don't have politicians here directly involved in the Namibian media, and I think that's a good thing. If you look at the Namibian as a newspaper, it's being owned by a trust 
and the trust has got no profit motive. The Namibian has been criticized already. Why don't they move to smarter offices? All of us that know Vintuk know that they are in a refurbished house in John Minot Street. They are not interested in a fancy big structure. Um, other media houses have got shareholders that have got their demands. You mentioned their toy So that is something um, that is just uh, uh, remarkable for the Namibian model in, in the true sense because it makes it very authentic. Uh, personally, I can just uh, encourage everybody to read two newspapers every day. I've always said it before, and the one is the front page of the Namibian, but also the editorial of our very own Toivo Injibela on the second page of the Namibian Sun every day, to me, is a must read. Um, I think the media are doing a fantastic uh, role here, playing a fantastic role in Namibia, and a very important role, and they've uh, contributed a lot to our political maturity which I've sensed in Namibia in the last few years. I quickly want to give, leave you with one example. We had elections in 2020 in Namibia, I think those were the local authority elections, where we had a change in government or in local authority um, dominance in, in office space, Bokomund and in Vintuk. And our former president at the time said, it's now time for other people to rule the local authorities. Let them show the responsibility, let them make the mistakes. And I think the transition of power was a very peaceful one. At the same time, one of the model democracies in the world, the USA, President Trump, former President, President Trump, lost the election, didn't accept the result until the very end, which culminated in a storm or a takeover, hostile takeover of Capitol Hill. So, so much for Namibian political maturity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that moving comment. Um, Monica, can I ask, do we have any uh, contributions from the virtual participants? One last opportunity from the floor. I was reprimanded, and so this will be very short. <laughs> My question is, we haven't really spoken about self-censorship. It was mentioned by Seth earlier that people are not employed because they lean in a wrong political direction or something like that um, uh, in, in employment, but we have the same in the media. The problem is in Namibia, and of course it's also a good thing, we all know each other. So you don't want to write something because your aunt may read it and the aunt would, would strongly disagree. Um, or your, your boss would strongly disagree, or your colleagues would uh, disagree. So, to my mind, um, self-censorship may be a problem. Your comment, please. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you very much. So, I, I just want to very, very briefly give you uh, <coughs> a bit of background. So, in, in around 2008, 2007, roundabout, the, there was this anger within government that uh, the media was getting away with murder, proverbial murder, um, and there was an idea to, for, the st for a state-regulated media environment. And uh, people fought back at the time and said, we cannot allow th this. It was set a, a very dangerous precedent. And that is how John's office was born, because government said, if you do not regulate yourselves, if you don't come up with a model that is going to regulate, where you are regulating yourself, we will regulate you. It, it then gave birth to, to the office of the media ombudsman. That is now at industry level. In-house, we are confronted and, and you have captured it uh, perfectly by saying we are such a small, close-knit community. Uh, I tell people that a week cannot pass now at my level as editor that I do not step on a toe of a friend that I was just having wine with the previous night. Because <laughs> if my reporter comes with a story, because we assign some of the stories to the reporters ourselves, but the bulk of the stories that reporters write, they gather that information themselves. If a reporter comes to the newsroom and say, look, I've picked up this information, how do I go about it? 
you can't say, oh, but since uh, that one, that guy is my cousin, uh, can you just, no. It's, it's because if I start doing that, I'll be doing it literally every third day. And, and my, cred my own credibility will be gone as an editor. Um, two years ago, a year ago, I had a situation where my cousin was arrested. First cousin, our parents are siblings. And uh, he was arrested, he appeared in court. And my reporters were excited about the story. They don't know that uh, the guy is my, is my cousin. They rushed to court, came back with the story. And uh, we had to run the story. Luckily, my uncle, the father of this guy, was proactive and he called me already in advance to say, look, it doesn't look possible that this story will not end up in your newspaper. We just want to assure you as a family that we understand your predicament uh, and we will not take, take offense if you, if you proceeded. Uh, and it happened. So it's, 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 it's extremely difficult. But uh, as much as we have not taken an oath, in, literally we, we have committed ourselves to this trade and we just have to, 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 do, to, to go with it. Yeah. Thank you very much. It seems that we have reached a point where we will be breaking for lunch. Uh, but since this was such a lively discussion, I would really like to encourage you to continue discussions in groups, and obviously the speaker is also around. Um, do I see another hand? Yeah. One interesting observation. I just downloaded the app of Analytia, and it seems to be very functional. <laughs> we are going to hit back. <laughs> okay, okay. But we at least can finish on this positive note. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much for the lively discussion. And um, I would like you to be back here by 2 o'clock when we start with uh, the other presentations. But let us not uh, finish without giving Toivo another round of applause.